reading this morning is from uh, the Gospel of John, John 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 29 to 42. Our message is only going to be on the first part of this reading. But we're going to continue on and read through verse 42. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him saying this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. Father God, as we begin to look into your word today, we pray that your Holy Spirit will anoint what is said, that, that we will hear, hear with eager ears. And, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we looked at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. This week we're kind of continuing the story from there. We're still on the shores of the Jordan River. Uh, John is in his place in the river. He's baptizing people who repent of their sins. He's teaching people, speaking. Uh, and he sees Jesus coming toward him. As soon as he sees Jesus, he gives this address, beginning with the words, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I've often wondered how well John knew of Jesus, if he knew anything of him at all. And I kind of think that, no, he didn't know anything about him at all. Even though his, the mothers were, were cousins, so I guess John and Jesus would have been second cousins, but, but apparently they really didn't know that, each other that well. Um, there's a couple of texts that, that suggest that here uh, this morning. Verse 31 that we read, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed. And then in verse 33, I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. So you wonder if John and Jesus had known each other before this. Certainly John didn't know Jesus was the Messiah. But even when Jesus sees John, when, when John sees Jesus, when, John, when Jesus comes to the river to be baptized himself, uh, he may have suspected, but there was certainly no pronouncement like there is here. Look, the Lamb of God. Uh, why? What changed between Jesus' baptism and, and Jesus coming to John today and John recognizing him as the Lamb of God? Well, what changed was that when Jesus was baptized and he went down into the water and he came back up, the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, and it stayed there. And, and one of the passages we read said that um, in verse 33, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain on is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So that Spirit coming down and resting on Jesus is, is what John the Baptist saw 
as the sign that this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. Now there's also a couple of verses in Isaiah that, that suggest the same thing. Uh, John the Baptist would have been familiar with the book of Isaiah. Uh, two verses, Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah wrote, a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And that Messiah is this branch that Isaiah is talking about. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So, so John knew that the one who the Spirit rested on would be the branch, the, the Messiah. The second verse, Isaiah 42, verse 1. And, and we'll come back to this verse a couple of times this morning. Uh, but it says, Here is my servant whom I will uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. So again, when, when John sees the, the spirit coming down, landing on Jesus, and staying there, that was a sign that the branch, or the Messiah, had come. And for John the Baptist, that was all the confirmation that he needed, that Jesus was, without a doubt, the expected Messiah. So when John sees Jesus today coming down to the river again, there's no doubt. Instead, there's this public proclamation that Jesus is indeed the Lamb of God. Now, what does that mean, that Jesus is the Lamb of God? What does it mean that he's the Lamb? Uh, I think there's three things that we can get pretty much out of the first part of this reading this morning that, that suggest that, that Jesus is the Lamb of God and what that means. Uh, John makes... Uh, three testimonies. He testifies about three things. He testifies that Jesus is a gift, Jesus is anointed, and Jesus is chosen. We're going to spend a few minutes looking at each one of these this morning. First, Jesus is a gift. He testifies that Jesus is a gift to the people of God. He is uh, the gift provided by God to take away the sins of the world. That phrase, the Lamb of God, may have different meanings to different people, and nobody really knows for sure what John exactly was, was talking about there. But most people believe that, that John is talking about the Passover lamb. Um, it refers to the Passover sacrifice. The Apostle John makes other references to the Passover and how Jesus kind of fulfills the requirements of the Passover sacrifice. Um, in fact, if you remember the crucifixion, You'll remember that, that John is the one that points out that the legs of the other two who were crucified with Jesus were broken. But Jesus' legs were not broken. Why is that important? Because part of the Passover sacrifice, when you prepared the lamb for the Passover sacrifice, you couldn't have a broken bone. You were not to break. Uh, no bones were to be broken. So, so John is telling us that Jesus is the perfect Passover lamb. Others think that this may, may refer to daily temple sacrifices. Uh, lambs were to be offered every morning and every evening in the temple. We see this in Exodus, uh, in chapter 27, they receive the notice of uh, the details on how they were to put together the, the tabernacle. Then in chapters 28 to 30, they receive instructions on, on, on how to use the tabernacle, what they are to sacrifice there and when. And, and, and how the priests should consecrate themselves for service. Uh, in, verses, in, in, in verse 29, verse 38, we see, this is what you are to offer at the altar regularly. Each day, two lambs, one year old, offer one in the morning and one at twilight. So, so some think that, that John is referring to the, to the daily sacrifice of a lamb. Revelation, we see another lamb. Revelation is written by John too. And in, and in chapter 5, verse 6, he writes, That I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. And if we read on in verse 9, they're, saying, they're singing, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for man, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. I, I guess we can't really be sure exactly what lamb John is referring to 
when he refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Uh, and I want to stress that it really doesn't matter theologically. Uh, it doesn't matter which Lamb. Uh, we just know that Jesus is a gift from God sent to take away our sins. That's the important part. That's what we should take out of this passage. Jesus is the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of our world. It doesn't matter which Lamb in Scripture you might relate him to. Um, the truth is that mankind has fallen. And every one of us was steeped in sin. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're still steeped in sin. Uh, but through the gift of God, God provided a way out of that. Peter proclaimed in Acts 4, verse 12, that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only gift from heaven uh, given to mankind which, uh, which, by which we're saved. A lot of people today say that it doesn't matter, that every religion is just a different path leading to the same place. The Bible doesn't give us much wiggle room there, though. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that Jesus is the gift and that Jesus is the only gift. If we receive that gift and we believe in his name and we follow his commands, um, we will be saved. If we don't, we won't be saved. It's a very simple gospel message. That's something it's too simple. But there's no wiggle room there. We believe in Jesus Christ who, to pay the penalty for our sin or we have to pay the penalty for our sin ourselves. You know, there seems to be such a push today towards tolerance and, and understanding and, 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 and being respectful of all religions. But don't bet your eternity on, on that relatively recent trend, uh, especially if it contradicts scripture. We tend to want to create our own image of God as someone who will just forgive everybody. God loves everybody. He's just going to forgive everybody, uh, especially if, if they're good, especially if they do good things or, or if they're good people. But don't go there. Be careful not to go there. Base your beliefs on biblical truths and understand that God is a loving God. But that doesn't mean he's just going to forgive everybody. You see, mankind is steeped in sin, like I said a few minutes ago. Uh, and sin is disobedience. And while God is loving and merciful, he's also just. And disobedience needs to be dealt with. So God showed his love for all of us by providing that way out. The way to deal with the sin and disobedience in our lives. So God provides the way of salvation. But we're still sinners and need to atone for our sin. There's two ways we can do that. We either deal with that ourselves. And the only way to do that is to spend an eternity paying the penalty for our sin. An eternity in hell. A place we don't want to go to. Or we can turn to Jesus. Who's paid that penalty for us. We can trust in him. And, 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 and make him our Lord and Savior. And obey him. That's the only way to deal with our sin without paying the penalty ourselves is to turn to Jesus through faith. Remember that when I say man is steeped in sin, that includes you, it includes me. We're all part of mankind. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're still steeped in sin. And you need to deal with it before it's too late. And remember, the only two ways to deal with it are paying the price yourself eternally where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth or to accept the gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus is a gift. The second testimony about Jesus is that Jesus is the anointed. Jesus is anointed. At the baptism, a few significant things uh, happen that, that are unique uh, about Jesus' baptism. We see in some of the other Gospels that 
uh, with the baptism itself that he went down under the, the surface of the water, uh, the fact that Jesus would go to John for the baptism. We have John's hesitancy to do the baptism. Then, then we see or, or hear the voice of God, this is my child whom, uh, whom I'm proud of, uh, whom I love. And, and then finally we see the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus. In John's Gospel, John only mentions one thing. He only mentions the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Of all the things that happened in Jesus' baptism, the only one that John thought was really important was that the Spirit came down and stayed on him. And again, we already saw Isaiah chapter 11 and chapter 42, which talk about the Messiah will have the Spirit come down and stay on him. Um, in Old Testament times, it wasn't all that unusual for the Spirit of God to come down and land on a prophet or a king or, or someone that God was going to use for a time. And then the Spirit would go back up again. Never in the Old Testament do we see the Spirit of God descend and stay on some, remain on him. The Spirit of God descended on Jesus and stayed on him. Um, this was something that was unheard of in Israel. Never happened before. It's the Messianic anointing prophesied by Isaiah in chapters 11 and 42. And we already saw those verses. This is the Son of God. There can be no doubt in John's mind. This is the one all of Israel has been waiting for. John had witnessed the dawning of the Messianic era. The Old Testament talks about the Messianic era uh, as a time of renewal when the Spirit would transform Israel uh, by resting on the Messiah himself. Uh, the Messianic era was a time that God would, would be with Israel and save Israel, transforming Israel into the true people of God. Jesus' anointing by the Holy Spirit was the sign that the Messianic era had begun. This has happened. Uh, and, and the time of renewal and salvation and, and transformation has, become, has, has begun. And it's not just for the people of Israel. So we can rejoice in that. Uh, not just will Israel be transformed and renewed. Paul writes in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. The Messiah and his anointing by the Holy Spirit makes possible our renewal and salvation and transformation. He's not just Israel's Savior. He can be our Savior. Third point, third testimony John is, is making when, he's, when he calls Jesus the Lamb of God is that Jesus is chosen. Jesus is chosen. Where do I get that from? In my NIV, in verse 34, it reads, I, I have the older NIV version. It says, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The newer NIV, the 2013 revision, says that, uh, has changed that to conform with some of the older manuscripts that they found since, uh, that use the words, God's chosen one. So, the New English Bible and New Living Translations also say that. Um, that I have seen and testify that this is the chosen of God, is the new wording there. And again, we saw that verse in, in Isaiah 42 earlier. It refers to the coming Messiah as my chosen one in whom I delight. John confirms that Jesus is God's chosen one. Um, and it's important for us to know that, that Jesus is God's chosen one, whom God has put his spirit on and that spirit remain. The chosen of God, uh, that wording goes straight to the heart of Isaiah 42. Is his testimony, his uh, prophecy of who Jesus will be. That this Messiah is known uh, by his unique anointing, his complete identity in the Spirit of God. No one else has ever been filled with the Spirit of God like Jesus has. So what does all this stuff mean for us? We, we have seen that Jesus is the gift uh, of God given to take away the sins of the world. We are a fallen people. 
And, and we can't pay the penalty for our sins, for our disobedience ourselves without going to that place and weeping and gnashing teeth where, where none of us want to go to. We need a gift from God. And Jesus uh, is that gift of God. God has given us uh, the means to, to take care of our sin without having to pay the penalty through faith in Jesus Christ. We've seen that Jesus was the chosen one, chosen by God to, re to, to receive his Holy Spirit to do this work. The other Gospels are known as synoptic Gospels. They, they share a lot of the same stories uh, in an effort to, to come to the point that Jesus is the Messiah. But John is a little different. John uses testimonies of people who have met Jesus and who have come away from that meeting, that time with Jesus, uh, knowing in their hearts that Jesus is the Messiah. This morning we heard John the Baptist's testimony of, of when he met Jesus. And he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. And John's life was changed forever because of that. And what the Apostle John is telling us in this passage is that we can trust that Jesus is the Messiah. And that our lives will be changed forever when we put our trust in him. John the Baptist met Jesus and he knew him and he tells us without a doubt, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the gift, the anointed one, the chosen one. Jesus will change our lives too as we come to faith in him and trust him and obey him. We can trust what John has said and testified about here because he is an eyewitness who, who has seen this for himself. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for John's testimony here. We thank you that John recognized Jesus was your son, our Messiah, sent to save us from our sins. And when we put our trust in him, you will save us from our sins. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.